Well, like uh, Dennis said, I'm Carl K9 LA. You can email ouch. You can email me at uh, K9 LA at, at ARRL.net, and there's the website. Uh, Dennis gave a good summary, so I won't go too far into this. I was uh, started as a shortwave listener in the late 50s, like probably many people did. I had a license from Popular Electronics, WPE9BQH. So that was that was pretty uh, heavy for a kid, uh, you know, <laughs> probably a 12-year-old kid, that's for sure. <clears throat> uh, like I said, my wife is Vicki, AE9YL. Well, she's getting up in years, too, and I always tell everybody pretty soon she's going to change it to AE9OL, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Also, I'm the uh, ARRL Central Division Vice Director. <clears throat> so let's get going here. Now, I got seven topics on my list here. Talk about cycle 24. Not too much to talk about. It's over. The current solar minimum. Uh, what can we expect? The propagation at solar min. The cycle 25 predictions that are out there. Talk about two simple HF antennas and how they perform. And talk about some vintage equipment. I always enjoy fixing and using vintage equipment. And talk a little bit about the digital mode advantage and encourage people to get on the digital mo mode if you're so inclined. Um, it, it's it's going to make uh, this solar minimum the most active on our higher bands, that's for sure. <clears throat> so, cycle 24 update. And there it is in terms of the 10.7 centimeter solar flux. You can see cycle 24 had two peaks. Where are we? Well, we're way over on the right. So we are at solar minimum, no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> why were there two peaks? Well, that's because uh, the two solar hemispheres weren't working together. Basically, one solar hemisphere was much more active and then it died out and then the other solar hemisphere came and was very active. Uh, this has only happened for uh, cycle 22, 23, and 24 of the magnitude we see. So uh, what does that mean in terms of solar cycles? I, I'm not sure anybody really knows. It just says that the two solar hemispheres aren't uh, working together. And if you were around for cycle 19 in 1957 or 58, whatever, uh, both solar hemispheres were working together and that's why they, uh, we had such a high peak. <clears throat> so how long are we going to be at solar minimum? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the, the good news is it looks like we're on the way up now. So, but the bad news, of course, is we're still way down there. Uh, this is the plot of previous solar minimums. There are five on the, on the left side of the chart. Those are the solar min between cycles 18 and 19, 19, 20, 20, 21, 21, 22, 22, and 23. And we got used to solar minimums only being about two years long. My definition of solar minimum is when the smooth sunspot number was below 20. So you can see we got kind of spoiled. You know, we go into solar min and it was pretty short and uh, next thing you know, we're, we're having a great solar cycle. Now, the big thick green curve, that's uh, the last solar min between cycles 23 and 24. As you can see, it kind of threw us for a loop. It lasted almost five years. Well, that was kind of <laughs> uh, frustrating, but uh, we lived through it. Cycle 24 did have some good six meter F2 openings around its peak in the fall and winter months. And uh, so we, 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 we enjoyed, oh well, we enjoyed. So what's the current solar minimum look like? That's the thick red line. And uh, as I said earlier, it looks like we're headed on the way up now. Looks like things have turned around, hopefully, and, and we'll be headed up. But it certainly looks like it's gonna be a solar minimum that's at least as long as the last one we were through. Not much we can do about it, just uh, you know, get on the low bands and uh, get on the digital modes. Uh, so, cycle 25 is alive, and hopefully it'll uh, 
get going and pick up and do some good for us here. <clears throat> Here's a picture of uh, our last solar min between cycle 23 and 24. And what it does is breaks out the sunspots by which solar cycle they belong to. Of course, the most obvious thing here is that solar cycles do overlap. Solar new sunspots from the new solar cycle are seen at the same time that we see sunspots from the old solar cycle. And we can tell the difference in two ways. One is the uh, uh, latitude at which a sunspot emerges, solar latitude, and also by the polarity of the sunspots. And uh, we, can, we can tell that too. But the big thing is solar cycles overlap. Uh, you can see the red, the, the green, heavy, smooth sunspot number was uh, uh, minimized around, looks like January of uh, 2009 or so. And you can see that uh, <clears throat> the actual solar cycle started about a year before that. We had the first uh, sunspot of cycle 24 was in January of 20, uh, 2000, uh, 2008. Now here's the, here's the current solar minimum between 24 and 25. Again, uh, this uh, distinguishes between the sunspots from uh, both solar cycles. The red is from cycle 24, the, cycle, the solar cycle it's ending. <clears throat> and the blue are the uh, cycle 25 sunspots, which are just beginning. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that the uh, solar minimum, which is historically defined as when the smooth sunspot number numerically minimizes, occurred in December 2019. So uh, that's generally when people say the cycle 25 started, but in July 2019, there was a cycle 25 sunspot already. So our definitions can be kind of contradictory here. Now you can see there was lots of good activity uh, in March, April, June, July, and August of 2009. And that caused the uh, smooth sunspot number, the green plot, to start rising. So far in, in September, we've not seen any sunspots. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Uh, it's been uh, quite a run of spotless days again, and uh, <laughs> who knows how long that's going to last? How, how long that's going to last? Okay, a pop quiz: Cycle Twenty Five is alive. What that picture there in the bottom right? What movie did that come from? Young Frankenstein. That's right. It's a great movie, but okay. You know, Gene Wilder declared that he's alive. So it kind of applies to cycle 25 now. Okay, what can we expect for propagation at solar minimum? Well, <clears throat> it should be kind of obvious that the low bands, 160, 80, 60, 40, and 30, should be open worldwide at night. And you should pay a special attention to sunrise and sunset at both ends of the path because there can be signal enhancements at, that, at those times. <clears throat> 20 meters and 17 meters to a somewhat lesser degree should be open worldwide during the day and early evening. Uh, even though there are zero sunspots and minimum solar flux, there's still enough extreme ultraviolet, which is the true ionizing radiation for the F2 region. There's still enough of that uh, radiation to keep 20 meters open and 17 meters to a somewhat lesser degree. We'll have occasional openings on the higher bands, 15, 12, and 10. They're mostly of a north-south nature, uh, at least from the Midwest here to the Caribbean, South America, Central America, and to VKZL. I'm sure you guys might have some VKZL and uh, uh, maybe even some to uh, Central America. And don't forget sporadic evening on 6 and 10 during the summer and also in December. <clears throat> the plot on the right is uh, some old data from 57 and 58, but it's uh, still valid. And it shows when you can look for sporadic E during the various months. Uh, it's best in the summer months, in the late morning and early evening. 
and you can see those are prob those contour lines are probabilities, so they can uh, uh, pretty high and uh, give you a good indication of what's going on with sporadic E. Now, we had a good sporadic E season in June and July, at least here in the Midwest. How was it out there on the West Coast? Did you have a lot of six meter openings? Anybody on six meters? Not too many, okay. Well, get on six meters. Uh, well, it's kind of kind of late in the sporadic E season. We haven't had much at all. So uh, start planning for next year. So how do you, how do we tell uh, what's happening on the band right now? Well, one great way is go to www dot dxmaps.com. What it does is they take the packet radio spot, spots and they plot them on a map. In other words, if uh, someone works someone else, that'll get plotted on the map. And that's uh, the spots for six meters on a June day of this year for about a, uh, uh, about a 16 minute period. You can see there was lots of activity. Now there's some other maps, WhisperNet, PSK Reporter, and if you really want to know what's going on in the higher bands, the IARU NCDXF beacons are there. <clears throat> they operate on 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. And in any three minute period, you can tell uh, where the uh, openings are on a given band. There are 18 beacons around the world, so it's got really good coverage. And they're, they're uh, planning on expanding, too, to get some more uh, beacons out there so we can tell what's going on worldwide propagation. Okay, cycle 25 predictions. Since cycle 24 is over, it's kind of time to look at, look at those predictions. That's just a list of the 27 that I'm aware of. If you want to really dig into it, you can uh, look at the presentation after I email it to Dennis. Now here's the distribution of those 27 predictions. I broke the smooth sunspot number up into uh, buckets of 25. And uh, you can see that uh, there's a pretty good consensus among solar scientists that uh, uh, the smooth sunspot number of cycle 25 is gonna be somewhere between 100 and 124. Now, the average of all the cycles, all 24 cycles, is 179. So that also tells us that most people think it's going to be a smaller than average cycle. <clears throat> but there's one uh, prediction out there way on the extreme right. It's predicting a big cycle. So let's take a look at that. Now, what it's based on is the length of a magnetic cycle inside the sun. You know, we talk about sunspot cycles and... Um, uh, you know, we, we, we count sunspots, and that's how we've kind of learned to define a sunspot cycle is by the sunspots. But really what's going on inside the sun is uh, uh, magnetic stuff that generates these sunspots. And that's what this uh, uh, group of authors tried to do is determine the length of a, the magnetic cycle inside the sun. And what they concluded is based on uh, when the magnetic cycle of 23 ended and when the magnetic cycle of 24 is probably going to end. Uh, they say that's nine years and four months and they had all data on previous uh, solar cycles. And what they did is, uh, well, what I did is I took their data and plotted a scatter diagram and it shows that uh, on the bottom is the time in years and on the left is the maximum smooth sunspot number of the next cycle. And that nine years, four months is the blue line and it says we're gonna have a big cycle. Uh, you can read more about that, those cycle 20 for 25 predictions at a paper I have on k9la.us. And again, uh, you'll have the, uh, the uh, presentation here later. But it's a pretty decent correlation. The, the correlation coefficient is 0.794, which says, well, that's pretty strong correlation. So that, that sounds great that their prediction may come true. But there's a contradictory view. Now, if we go back to looking at sunspots, 
if we plot how long we were at solar minimum versus how big the next cycle was, what it comes out is uh, the longer we're at solar min, the smaller the next cycle. And uh, assuming the solar min between 24 and 25 was around five years, that's the red line, it says we're gonna have another small cycle. Um, so which, 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 which one of these is most accurate? It it's also has a pretty high correlation coefficient of 0.763. So there's some, something fundamentally wrong with one of these predictions. And all I can say is I'll let you know around 2023 or 2024, which one came out right. Uh, we may know a little bit earlier because a big cycle rises quicker. So that may tell us or give us a clue what's going on here in the next year or two. Okay, simple HF antennas. <clears throat> Well, we're not going to talk about five element 80 meter Yagi's uh, or even bigger things like that. <laughs> we're going to talk about, uh, first we're going to talk about a vertical. Uh, <clears throat> I have a Hustler 4 BTV. The BTV stands for uh, ba uh, four band trap vertical. It operates 40, 20, 15, 10. It's about uh, 18 foot high. It needs radials. Common perception uh, is that a vertical radiates equally poor in all directions. Oh, I put this on our garage roof. I had two radials for 20 meters, two for 50, and two for 10. Uh, I got on for the ARRL DXCW contest in February 2002. That was around the uh, maximum of cycle 23, so the sunspots really helped on the higher bands. Uh, I did not use an amplifier. I didn't look at packet cluster. I had to tune the band and listen to the station, whoever it was, and then uh, work them if I hadn't worked them before. There are a lot of stations I couldn't work. <laughs> Pileups were just too big for my 100 watts to a vertical. Most of the contacts were not one call and I was in the log. It took several uh, several calls to, to get in the log and, and even uh, leaving a pileup and coming back the next day when things were a little bit thinned out. I ended up with 91 countries uh, for an 18 hour weekend effort. And uh, that's not too bad for 100 watts to a vertical that supposedly only radiates poorly in all directions. So that's one simple antenna that doesn't take up a lot of room. You do got to add some radials though. Another antenna that uh, seems to work good as an inverted V. It's a cousin of a dipole. It's good because it only needs one support. And uh, its performance is similar to a dipole. The common perception for a dipole or inverted V is uh, if it's at low height, it's a cloud warmer, so you can't work any distant stations. So in February 2009, I got in the ARRL DXCW contest. I had a 40, 20 meter inverted V. Apex was at 40 feet, which is un it's not too unreasonable for uh, most people to achieve. 40 meter inverted V, each side is about 33 feet. So it might fit on a lot of properties. Now the contest in February 2009 was uh, a smooth sunspot number of 1.9, so that was a solar minimum period. And that's why I didn't get on 15 and 10 meters because the bands just were not open. And I used my old Viking Ranger 2 and my Drake 2B. That's two pieces of vintage equipment. The Ranger put out about 50 watts, no amplifier, no packet cluster. And I ended up with 79 countries. Again, I couldn't work several stations and most of the contacts were not one call and in the log. <clears throat> it was interesting to use a separate transmitter and receiver because I, I you know, tuned the Drake 2V to a signal, then I had to move the, the Ranger 2 VFO to that frequency. It's not a transceiver. Boy, that makes it a lot simpler and quicker. Now, here's a real good example of uh, a very low inverted V in the ARRL 160 contest in uh, last December. I uh, have an inverted V apex is at 45 feet. That's pretty low. And the ends are bent to fit on the property. 
So one would think, well, okay, you could probably work a couple states and that'll be it, right? Now I used an amplifier this time, 1000 watts. I used my shared apex loop for receive to help with uh, receive noise, atmospheric and man-made noise. Then I worked 49 states, I missed Alaska, didn't even hear Alaska. I did work some Western Europeans and Caribbean. And uh, my comment is an amplifier really helps on 160. Uh, you guys would probably have much more trouble because you got the auroral zone sitting there <clears throat> in the way to Europe, but you could probably work, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, Japan pretty good with, uh, with a low inverted V, especially with probably a lot of salt water between. <clears throat> Now, a good vertical on 160 uh, always, or 99% of the time, beats a low inverted V. But you can still work a lot of stations with the inverted V. Uh, a lot of times you see comments about, you know, the, my, my vertical beats the dipole or the inverted V most of the time. And you kind of assume that, well, you couldn't work anything with the inverted V, but that's not true. There's stuff there to work. You just got to get in there and do it. Vintage equipment. <clears throat> this is my novice station and my early general. It's a national NC60. It's a, the good old all-American five-tube receiver. Covered four bands from AM to 30 megahertz. It didn't have an RF stage, so that limited my activity on 15 meters back when I was a novice. The venerable uh, Heathkit DX35 um, <clears throat> and a VF1 VFO, which I acquired after uh, after I got my general, and I didn't have to have a little box full of crystals laying around. That was pretty good. That that station right there is active in street key night, and I enjoy getting on with the street key and having fun. <clears throat> it works surprisingly well, and but it is very crude compared to what we have today. And one thing, of course, it's easy to work on that stuff. Now, here's the station I used for the for that DX contest on 40 and 20 meters in 2009. It's the Ranger 2 on the left, uh, Drake 2B and its Q multiplier, an old Helicrafter's TO keyer, and uh, manual transmit receive switching. And I had a great time. Again, this, both of these are very easy to work on. Uh, you just got to watch out for, you know, voltages, but uh, you learn to do that. And uh, this was a great station back in the early 60s, that Ranger with the VFO and it had AM. It covered 160 through six meters, so uh, it was pretty good. The Drake 2B only covered uh, 10 through 80. It'd be nice to have 160 and 6 to make it compatible with the uh, Ranger 2, but uh, that's the way it goes. So here, uh, here, here's some vintage equipment. Here's the status of my vintage equipment. Uh, uh, th there are two things that are in working order. The half Helicrafters SX, SX100. It's a good old Helicrafters general coverage receiver. Hammerland HQ170. That's a uh, a true boat anchor. It's big. It's ham bands only and it covers 160 and 2 meters. So I had to think about pairing it with the Ranger too. That'd be, that'd be a great great station to have. Then I've got a bunch of stuff in queue. Uh, WRL Globe Chief, a Viking Challenger, another Hammerland HQ 170 that someone gave me. They gave it to me. And uh, two Helicrafters receiver that uh, they were given to me also. So uh, hopefully I'll get these uh, going one of these days. And I just enjoy fixing and using them. That's for sure. The digital mode advantage. Well, a CW op and say, all I hear is noise on 10 meters. And here comes a digital mode op. He says, hey, 10 meters is open. Oh my gosh. So what what is the advantage? Well, let's take a look at uh, the duration of a QSO versus the sensitivity. And this comes from the WSJTX documentation. Uh, JT5 back in its day, it took about four minutes to make a QSO. 
but its sensitivity was very low. It could detect a signal all the way down to a minus 25 dB signal to noise ratio. That's not bad. And uh, then Joe Taylor and uh, the other guy, K6, uh, K9AN, uh, Frank or Steve, something like, I don't remember, introduced FT8, got the, QSO, the duration of a QSO down to about a minute but you lost a little sensitivity. They can only detect down to maybe about minus 21 dB signal to noise ratio. In other words, 21 dB below the noise. And in the desire to speed things up, FT4 came out. It takes about 20 seconds to make a Q cell. And again, sensitivity is lost. So another five dB or so. Now, <clears throat> CW takes about 15 minutes if you're clipping along at about 30 words a minute that you can uh, exchange, you know, do an exchange between two stations in a contest in about 15 seconds or less. And that minus 12 dB limit is what I measured uh, using uh, my Omni 6 and a signal generator. And I could, I could uh, hear an equivalent of minus 12 dB, 12 dB signal to noise ratio signal. So you can see that JT65 had about, has about 13 dB advantage over my 12 dB, my CW copying ability. That's a heck of a lot. And even FT4 has 4 dB and that could, uh, <laughs> that can make a big difference. So each new digital mode traded sensitivity for speed to complete a Q-cell. I don't know if there's gonna be another uh, digital mode coming out, but it's, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it'll be, uh, FTCW or something, I don't know what it would call it. Now FT8 took off in mid-2017 and leads the pack. Um, <clears throat> will FT4 take over? I don't know. Mostly it's been used for de-expeditions up till now, but it's, it's getting used in contests, so we'll see what happens. Now how does that advantage help? Well, for one thing, uh, the signal, when you're on a digital mode, the signal can be below your noise level and how much below depends on which digital mode you're using, but it's gonna be better than uh, what you can do with copying CW. Now there might be some really good CW ops who have a good ear brain interface that can uh, you know, maybe challenge FT4 and maybe even FT8, but uh, for me, nah, the digital modes are gonna be an advantage. Now there's another way that the advantage can show up is uh, Normally we think of communications uh, that uh, will occur only if the operating frequency is below the maximum usable frequency, the MUF of the ionosphere. And that's depicted in uh, <clears throat> figure A there on the left. And it just shows that uh, if the sunspot number is high enough, the signal is refracted back to earth. And generally what we've thought is that uh, if the sunspot number is uh, less than 75, it'll go right through the ionosphere. And that's what the B uh, figure shows. Uh, but observations have shown that uh, QSOs can still be made when the frequency is somewhat below the MU, uh, that should be above the MUF. I got a typo there. So I'll correct that. So, so <clears throat> communications can still be made when the frequency is somewhat above the MUF. Normally we would have thought that can't happen. But what seems to appear happening is some kind of scatter mode. And that's depicted on that figure on the right. Most of it goes through the ionosphere, but there's still some uh, RF that's scattered back and we can, uh, we can hear that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, what the scatter mode implies is that you're going to lose, lose some signal level. There'll be more loss, but that's okay because uh, on the higher bands, there's not much ionospheric absorption. So you got a lot of room to uh, take advantage of the, 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 uh, the digital modes. Now, uh, I wrote an article about all this in the October 2017 QST. So if you're interested, want to dig into that, go take a look at that. Okay, here's a summary. Well, we've been through another long solar moon. Hopefully things will start picking up uh, pretty soon. 
Uh, cycle 25 is definitely alive. How alive it is? Well, hopefully we'll know in a couple months. And maybe in a couple months we'll kind of get a, a, a little hint of what it's going to do. Now, the low bands in 20 and 17 will still offer worldwide QSO, so uh, there's lots of work to be done on the, on the lower bands and in 20 meters. In fact, uh, if you, you can only put up one antenna, a, 20, a good 20 meter antenna is a great way to go because it'll hold up through solar max, through solar min, the whole sunspot cycle. <clears throat> Don't forget a sporadic E. That, that'll lighten up your uh, summers on six meters and 10 meters. Look for some occasional openings on uh, 15, 12, and 10. And don't forget that simple antennas work with 100 watts. Uh, CW is better than sideband. And FT8 is better than CW. Uh, FT4 is too. So uh, take advantage of the... Uh, uh, the technology that's being developed now. Have fun with vintage equipment. I, I really enjoy it. And take advantage of those digital modes. I can't stress that enough. <clears throat> In the lower right-hand corner is my little homebrew 10-meter QRP uh, single sideband transceiver. Uh, but it needs lots of help from sunspots. It only runs about a watt peak envelope power. So uh, it needs a decent antenna and needs lots of sunspots for 10 meters. Hopefully, uh, I'll be around long enough to use that thing again. <laughs> we'll see. I've already been through, uh, I think it's eight, uh, let's see, 19, 20, 21, 22, 3, 24. Yeah, I've been through six solar cycles, and uh, cycle 25 will be my seventh, so we'll see what happens. So, Dennis, that's all I had. If anybody's got any questions, I'll uh, be glad to try and uh, answer them. So I'll kick it off. Carl, I have a question. Sure. Well, you talked a little bit about sporadic E. Um, where, what's the source for um, those ions so high up? Because it's in the E layer, so it's not like tropospheric ducting that's going to be down <clears throat> close right. to the earth where weather is, is causing it to happen. But w what is it about the summertime that causes sporadic E to happen? Well, I'm not... I don't think we know for sure what happens, but we're pretty sure that uh, uh, meteors ablating in the atmosphere are what give us all those uh, electrons up there. And it's it's amazing how many meteor debris is up there. Uh, you know, you, you think of uh, space debris, you know, rockets and pieces, but uh, meteor debris is a lot more. And that's what gets rearranged by uh, uh, winds up at E region altitudes and by wind shear at those altitudes. And it, and it takes all that meteor debris, the electrons, and, and uh, uh, compresses them into thin, very dense layers. Uh, we don't have a complete understanding of a sporadic E if we ever do, then we won't have to call it sporadic E anymore, right? <laughs> we'll know what it is. Um, but all we can do is predict statistically when it's likely to occur right now. But uh, the source is uh, uh, meteor ablation up in the, ion up in the atmosphere. And uh, from there, things can get pretty uh, technical on uh, trying to understand what's going on. Hopefully, I answered your question, Dave. Interesting, though, although I, when I think of meteor showers, I tend to think of that as in the fall time. Not no, we're not, we're, not, we're not talking meteor showers. There's meteor debris all year round. Oh. Ah, yeah. Oh, okay. In fact, I, I can remember a really great paper. They, uh, uh, they plotted the occurrence of sporadic E and of course that peaks in the summer and they plotted the uh, uh, deposition of meteors in the atmosphere and that peaked in the summer too. 
So that strongly suggests that meteors are the cause. There, there wasn't a strong correlation for the December, which you know, kind of, everybody still scratches their head about that. But maybe one of these days, uh, of course, you know, it, it takes someone to get interested in uh, looking in that and having funding to look into it. So we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you very much. That's the nicest explanation I've ever heard. So excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, Carl, I have another question. You mentioned, uh, well, actually had a graph, a couple of graphs where we, where we had the association of solar spots that actually belong to one of the other cycle. How exactly can we tell them apart? Which one belong there? Because to me, it's yeah, just... There's, yeah, there's a, there's a good example. Okay. So what it is, when a, when a new solar cycle starts, the sunspots emerge at the higher solar latitudes. Okay, and as the sunspot cycle progresses towards the end of that cycle, the sunspots are emerging near the solar equator. So, attitude question. Okay, and then, then the other way to confirm that is with the polarity. You know, a sunspot is just a, 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 a loop in the magnetic field, and we can measure, you know, which, which, which end's going in, which is coming out, and, and, uh, uh, the new sunspots from the new cycle are opposite polarity too. So it, it really is kind of easy to tell as long as, you know, you can measure all that stuff and, and we can. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. Carl, there's a couple uh, questions in the chat here for you as well. Uh, one was okay. how, how long were the radials and where were they located in relationship to the garage for your vertical hustler HF antenna? Okay, well, the, uh, like I said, it was mounted on the garage roof, which is a single story. It's uh, just a garage. Um, I mounted, temporarily mounted it at the peak of the roof. Eh, the peak of the roof's probably about, oh, I don't know, 15 feet above ground, I guess. And uh, I had two 20 meter radials, which uh, each was about 16 feet. I had two 15 meter radials, which each was about 11 feet, and two 10 meter radials, each was about eight feet. And I just spread them around the vertical. Uh, and, you know, just, just kind of put them down and you know, spread them out, spread them out around the vertical. And it seemed to work pretty good. Uh, now, I, I have to admit that we live in a kind of a rural area north of Fort Wayne. So our noise level is quite good out here. Uh, for example, on a, on a winter night, once the S meter sits around minus, F, sits around S3 on 160 meters on my, uh, on, a, on 160 meter vertical for transmit. So it's quiet and that's, that's got to help, especially with a vertical, which tends to pick up more man-made noise. And that's what, that's one advantage of, uh, you know, if, if I had, uh, if I had to put up a vertical or inverted V, I'd sure try and go for the inverted V because with an inverted V, you don't have to worry about ground. You don't need radials or anything like that. And, uh, also, the inverted V would pick up a little bit less noise because it's not all vertically polarized. So there's just a preference that I'd uh, live with if I had to. Are, so are you aware of any, um, uh, well, so it's been called sporadic E for a very long time and we don't seem to know much more about it, right? Right. Um, instead of predictable E. Uh, right. So, uh, uh, so there's a question here that says, is anyone mining the data on dxwatch.com uh, to space weather data, for space weather data to look for correlations? You... Well, what, what we need to do is understand what's going on up at E region altitudes in the atmosphere. Uh, I don't think we need more QSO data. We just need to understand what's going on up there. 
Now, there's a fellow in uh, uh, in the uh, in Great Britain. He's a, a meteorologist by profession. G three uh, YKA, I believe. And uh, Jim uh, is trying to tie sporadic E with with uh, terrestrial weather. You know, thunderstorms. Uh, jet streams, you know, that kind of stuff and high and low pressure areas. Uh, I'm not sure where his uh, <clears throat> investigation stands. He gave a presentation at the RSGB convention a couple of years ago, I think it was two years ago, about uh, where that all stands. And uh, it's pretty interesting to try and, uh, you know, correlate to what's going on up in the atmosphere. I, I could have sworn I saw some, uh, was it the, didn't I just see like the latest AWRL newsletter about E, so e region sounding, their ability to do some soundings yeah. in the E region yeah. and maybe map out these clouds? Yes, that'll be interesting to see the, uh, the, the paper that ultimately gets, you know, published because there weren't a lot of details in the, uh, in the announcement there. Yeah, so, I went looking on their site uh who i forget who it was down in white sand the white sands area and they yeah. uh there wasn't much more available there either i was thinking well yeah this, yeah. this could be fascinating i want to know yes. more about this but uh, oh yeah it could be and uh <laughs> yeah that's tiger and i think it's going to be in uh, radio science and i'm sure looking forward to reading it when it does come out whenever it comes out in fact, uh, there was a guy named Whitehead, I think, that had uh, a two-part article in uh, QST a while back about sporadic E, what we knew about it. And probably hasn't, much hasn't changed since then either, I bet. <laughs> so what type of soundings would those be? How would, would they shoot a rocket up there, or what, what do you do? No, it wasn't very clear to me. Uh, it, it's like they use noise from transmission lines, you know, the, the you know, the, the uh, AC transmission line, you know, the high tension lines, and somehow did something. Uh, I don't claim to understand what they did, but I'm sure the paper will explain it. Yeah, it looked like a kind of a passive sonar idea or yes. a passive radar yes. idea where yes. they were listening listening for noise or and they might have mentioned broadcast stations or tv stations or something uh, yeah yeah here it is uh did they mention yep. here uh, yeah i was gonna say the new method leverages unintentional rf emissions from power lines using the broadband radio noise they can map and track dense sporadic e structures since power lines are widespread, we can observe sporadic E over a very large region surrounding our observatory, the long wavelength array in New Mexico. Yeah, you know, the, we, we can only understand uh, where a cloud is by our contacts, right? Which uh, could be uh, few and far between. So if we can get more information on how big a cloud is and maybe how dense it is, that's got to help. So you mentioned um, uh, meteor debris. Mm -hmm. So there's a question here is about, about as the Earth rotates around the sun, does the Earth pass through asteroid belts? Uh, could this be correlated to sporadic E? So do we, so we don't, I haven't ever noticed a correlation specifically to sporadic E and meteor mm -hmm. showers. It's yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that either. Uh, of course, if a meteor shower happens in the summer months, then uh, <laughs> it could uh, it could enhance it. But uh, apparently, we don't need meteor showers to have sporadic E. Yeah, it always seems we always talk about summer months and like the June contest windows being yep. the. Yep the big sporadic E window yep. Yep. and yeah, so that was, it doesn't see, well, and of course, you, if you get a meteor shower, that's a different 
you've got JT65 yeah, and some other modes to do that stuff, to play with that. Generally, I think a meteor would be meteor scatter and it'd be a, a much weaker signal because right. scatter implies loss. So. And also a shorter duration, right? Um, right, much, scatter, yeah. Much, much shorter in duration. Yeah, you'd probably have trouble on FT8, I bet. <laughs> yep. There is a, there is a, what, MSK144? Meteor, uh, uh, meteor scatter mode. I'm not sure what, how, what, what Joe Taylor does with it, how that works, but uh, there is a meteor scatter mode, you know, which is a whole other subject. You know. Right, and that one he just sends, repetitively sends the same really short duration burst, yeah. okay. hoping to, to catch something flying by. Yep. Yep. And, Yeah, as opposed to sporadic E, you can have for, well, I guess my, my experience with it is it can last for hours. Yeah, you can have, you can have sideband contacts, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I don't see any more, oh, wait, what's this? Uh, other than uh, your website, are there websites like spaceweather.com that can be used to track current conditions? Oh, there's a, there's a whole pile of them. I should, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll add another slide to here showing uh, some places you can go look for uh, uh, current uh, stuff. For example, uh, uh, there's a, I think it's called as KC2G. He pulls data from ionosons and then uh, shows a world map of uh, what the MUF is, the maximum usable frequency at, uh, you know, at pretty near real time. From that, you can kind of judge what's going on. Um, uh, of course, you should always kind of take a look at the, the K index, which is on spaceweather.com or uh, Space Weather Prediction Center. And of course, there's Solar Ham and, oh man, there's all kinds of websites with all kinds of data. QRZ, QRZ.com's got the banner from N0, uh, uh, NBH, I think it is, that, that tells uh, the current K index, the A index, solar flux, sunspot number, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. Your sporadic E charts there with the two, the, across the two seasons, that yep. is a fascinating chart that I've never seen before. It looks like, oh, okay. looks like you haven't seen it since, right? Is that what since it's from what 1956 or something oh 57 58 57 58 yeah no, it's uh yeah uh, well nothing like that now what we what many people have done is use gps system um of course that you know from a satellite down to ground so that goes through the sporadic e and they can measure the amplitude variation and the uh phase variation between the L1 and L2 signals, frequencies, and they can uh, plot worldwide maps of, maps of sporadic E where things are happening. And it agrees very well with this old data here. Well, it's uh, interesting, both those years had like, uh, looks like in December, they had some amount of sporadic E too. And that's, that seems so. Uh, it's interesting that it wasn't it wasn't exactly an anomaly, obviously, since it repeated right. in year. Right, and it even well, I don't, I don't know. I'll have to look at the look at that uh, G, the, the uh, it's called occ occultation data occultation data whatever and uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it showed some December stuff too. It, it also showed that, uh, if you want to believe it, that uh, where sporadic E occurs is changing a bit. Well, that was my other question. Is this, yeah, yeah this, is this some, based on some specific location or? Yeah, this is six meter, this is six meters for North America. Okay. And of course, you know, back when that data was generated, that was, you know, pretty important because, uh, you know, trying to get data back then is tough. But nowadays with the GPS stuff, uh, yeah, we can, uh, we can see what happens. In fact, uh, 
I took a look at that once, you know, what's the difference between sporadic E now and sporadic E a long time ago. And, you know, what comes into play may be how the Earth's magnetic field is changing, uh, not only in uh, where the uh, north and south pole are, north and south poles are, but also, you know, the strength of the Earth's magnetic field is kind of uh, decreasing. You know, we're getting ready for a <clears throat> reversal of our magnetic field one of these days. That's going to be fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be a mess. <laughs> in no Excel to draw those pretty charts. Yep, yep. Wow. Uh, that's all I see here. Okay. Any well, other good. Questions? I'm glad I could answer some questions and hopefully, uh, whatever. So look for. Uh, Look for this presentation. Uh, give me a day or so, and I'll add a couple other things to it at the end. We'll look at stuff. And That'd be great. Maybe throw in some other stuff. <laughs> Whatever. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Everybody. Carl. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. You great. Yep. Yeah, thanks. It's great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I better get uh, get upstairs to bed. The cat's getting kind of. It's time for him to go to bed. <laughs> yep. Thank you for staying up late to give us that talk. Appreciate that. Oh, that's okay. Hey, the the later I stay up, the one less pee during the night I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl. <laughs>